So each of our speakers uh, will have a, a brief 20 minutes to share uh, their expertise and wisdom with us. We'll have about five minutes for Q&A. So please feel free, uh, drop questions into the, the stage chat window. I'd love to share uh, questions with our speakers uh, before they close out. Um, and so uh, to start us off today, our, for our second segment, um, we have, of course, uh, none other than Isabel Mooney, who's the co-founder of 42 Crunch and Field CTO. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Isabel. My pleasure. And uh, welcome, everyone. Great. So I invite you to uh, we'll share your screen and and uh, and we'll step aside and, and the stage is yours. Absolutely. You should see my screen right now. It's been shared for a while. And I should get started. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone uh, again uh, to this session. So in the next 20 minutes, we will be talking about APN security challenges and uh, requirements. The idea uh, really of this presentation has been to serve as an introduction for the rest uh, of the API security track. Uh, so we'll look at from a high level view at all the different problems that are stacking up around APIs right now and give you some I'll give you some highlights of recommendations, and then the next speakers will deep dive in, in some of the specific areas, depending on their respective uh, expertise, right? So it's going to be no uh, surprise to anyone that, that API breaches are really on the rise. There's been this very recent report about a, a couple of weeks ago uh, stating that only 6% of companies are lucky enough to report there are no API related problems. Uh, for them, um, and all the others do report problems. And if we look at those, and, and um, you know, I encourage you to have a look at, at API Secure.io. This is uh, something that we create at 42 Crunch, completely uh, community-driven and, and, and agnostic, uh, just to you know help the community understand the, those different problems. Those breaches that we looked at in, in the past three years, uh, we'll see. We have a all pretty much always the same problems happening, right? It's all about validation of data. It's about rate limiting problems. It's about authorization. It's about authentication. And what we're going to do now is kind of deep dive a little bit in, in each of those. Uh, but before we do, um, you know, I, I'm working with a lot of customers um, around those problems. And if you look at different problems that they bring to us, we'll see that there's common patterns that are happening, right? And you may not have all of those patterns in, in, in your environment, but certainly this is something we see everywhere. Uh, first of all is the change of architecture. So now we're building very different applications than when I started working on, on APIs and, and integration. Um, now we have a really completely API-centric, API-driven architecture, and this has expanded very much the attack surface. And the reason is, we used to do a lot of validation and work on the server side and then just you know massage the data and return it to applications would be. Um, and, and there was a lot of control happening on the server side. But that, that's control really has been moved partly or maybe a lot, uh, maybe too much, uh, you could argue, on the client side. So now we have APIs that return raw data. And this raw data needs to be exposed through some kind of interface. And a lot of the business logic on filtering the data, maybe grouping the data, a lot of information is being done on the client side, which basically means that if I go straight into the API, then none of that logic or control is actually happening. So there's a lot of problems that are actually coming from, from this. Uh, the, the second thing that we see is, uh, you know, first of all, um, the number of APIs has exploded this new type of architectures is really defin definitely has a huge impact in that. The more distributed our applications, the more APIs we actually have and have to manage. And, and on top of the number of APIs, we also have very agile and very productive uh, development teams that have a whole bunch of tools and help to actually write APIs and applications as fast as possible, but we haven't really equipped our security people with the same means uh, to actually scale security. So a lot of the problems we see is because API security and securing APIs is really not scaling enough, right? Um, next will be um, APIs are all about data and, and really it's about protecting data. So for to protect data, we require context, right? And, and whichever traditional security approaches, application security approaches we were taking, 
are really not really working anymore because they don't understand that context. They don't understand that data. They just have you know, a different way of working based on how architected our applications were five or 10 years ago, right? And, and, and basically, what this leads to is we have different vulnerabilities. I'm sure along the day, you're going to hear a lot about the API security top 10 without getting into the details because we're going to do this now. But there's like three main groups in, in those problems, right? Problems around data, problems around authentications and authorization, and problems around more governance and, and operations, I would say, around APIs. So there's a new level of threats and vulnerabilities that we have to take care of, right? And finally, to make all of this very complicated and hard to manage, right? Unfortunately, security is still an afterthought, right? We, we tend to, you know, it's, it's mainly linked not to, you know, bad faith or people wanted to do bad things, not at all, but just simply, you know, uh, I would say requirements uh, uh, and, diff and different teams which are conflicting sometimes, right? Development is really all about developing applications because business is expecting them for yesterday, right? And, and in that context, sometimes security is, is very much an afterthought and something that we look at, at very late into the life cycle into the APIs. And that really is unhelping and I'm going to explain you why in, in this presentation. So first let's talk about authentication. In, in all those problems, you know, and many of the issues we have with APIs today, authentication is really a big problem, right? Um, so broken authentication, as you, you know, the, the name basically says, this is like number two in, in that top 10 we looked about. This is very similar to the traditional OWASP top 10, which is related to applications and not specifically to APIs. They have actually the same position, which is the second in the list, right? So what this is all about, um, it's all about defining and enforcing how authentication is going to work and making sure nobody can break, basically, uh, access to your APIs. And there's multiple things that I see happening in here. First of all, um, and this is like a general thought, it applies very well to authentication, but also to many parts of application, uh, API security in general. We need to know our APIs and we need to understand what is the risk associated to those APIs in order to define what is the correct way of doing authentication, right? It's not the same to do authentication in the open banking than it is to do it, you know, for the, the weather application. Because the risks, the consumers, the data which is being uh, transported through our APIs is very different. So one size does not fit all here. So the first thing really you need to do in order to decide how authentication is going to be done, and what is the proper way for you to do this, is doing some kind of threat modeling where you will analyze, okay, what is this API? Who is gonna consume it? Which data is going to be uh, manipulated and access, accessed through those APIs? Uh, what is the sensitivity of that data? Is it very sensitive information like payment information or is it, non-sensitive information like the list of ATMs or around where I live, right? It's very different data, very different use case, right? Um, and, and, you know, working with our customers, there's one still very, you know, a, a, a problem, I would say, or a misconsumption that's very widely uh, spreading <laughs> across APIs, which is to use API keys or bearer tokens, like creating an OAuth token or a JWT token, for authentication, right? So this is very you know, important to understand when you have something like somebody gets an, AP, gets an API key or gets an access token through some way of authentication, right? Once you have that, that doesn't prove who I am anymore. And the easiest way to think about this is if you think of a token like an hotel key, right? You go to the reception, you present your passport, you present a credit card, you know, this is you basically there obtaining that hotel key. Now you can take that hotel key, you can go to your door and open it, or you can give it to someone else because you forgot something in your room, right? And when and that key will work, although that person that you gave the key to is not the original person that obtained that key, that was your, yourself, right? So be very careful about using, you know, it's very tempting to do that. Um, you can see a Niper link here on that like a hotel key. There's a whole article behind this that I encourage you to read to understand, you know, how to mitigate and, and what to watch for 
if you, you know, are using uh, keys like this for authentication. Um, so in the open banking world, and this is really expanding beyond open banking, um, we have some very, very well done security profiles around authentication and how to use OpenID Connect as opposed to OAuth for authentication, uh, about using multi-factor authentication. This is like a requirement in, in many banks right now, and you've seen that if you're using your banking applications, right? And in general, a lot of the problems around APIs here are happening uh, on authentication and password reset endpoints. As you can imagine, those are like the, the keys to the kingdom. Um, if I can abuse that, if I can break that, if I can you know, obtain tokens, I can uh, take over uh, a user's account, we can do credential stuffing like replay, um, maybe some databases uh, from the dark web, a user password leaked system that, that I can use to abuse your system and see if I can get in. There's all kind of potential problems here around authentication, right? So you have to be, um, there's two things that are really recommended here, right? One is really to specifically design uh, rate limiting around those specific endpoints. Well, again, rate limiting is not something where you have like one, whatever, my API admits 100 requests per second, right? Okay, so that's over, overall. But this is a very different thing to design rate limiting to an overall you know, API than designing it for specific authentication endpoints such as the password reset ones. For those ones, first of all, it's a human who is being, um, you know, interacting with this. So probably, you know, 200, let's say 200 requests per second is, is not going to cut it because no human will ever be able to do that. Right, so you have to adapt your rate limiting to a human interacting with the system, right? And the other thing that you have to be very careful about is discovery processes, right? And here we have to find a sweet equilibrium between um, helping a real users and not giving too much away to a potential hacker. But um, when somebody is trying to get on your system, should they put a bad user, should they put a bad password, a combination of both? We really don't want to give them any hints of what is wrong, right? Because if I'm giving you a different error message when a user is wrong or a password is wrong, then I'm giving away the fact that, oh, that user exists in my database, right? We don't want that. You want exactly the same message, and then you have to find an out-of-bound way to give a proper message to real and legitimate users. But be very careful about this so that by playing some robots or some with some uh, data, I cannot from the error code or from the error message uh, find out what is wrong, user or password, right? So there's a whole set of recommendation at the OWASP here, and of course, um, that you can go and read. Uh, this is a very well-known problem. And of course, you need to test this, right? So this is another key thing in terms of, of APIs is you want and you have to test uh, all this kind of problems. And I'm gonna talk more about this as we go on. Uh, so that's for authentication. So same thing happens for authorization. So at the authorization level, this is all about accessing data or accessing operation. Let's do different things, right? You have two top uh, problems in authorization. One to you know manage the access to a specific resource. And this is what's called BOLA, right? So this is really about Isabel being allowed to access account one, two, three in a certain mode. Let's say I'm get mode, right? But not in edit or delete mode. Um, and, you know, Carl is not allowed to access account one, two, three, you know, in delete mode, but can actually edit it, right? So it's this really fine grain authorization problem. This is not about being able to access a specific operation, it's about being able to access a specific resource, like in this case, an account, a specific account, right? So really what this is about is a very fine grain authorization problem, right? Somewhere in your code, uh, in an external decision engine, you need to be able to enforce this kind of rules, which can be quite complicated because you have to take into account who the user is, what they want to access, what they want to do on that specific uh, resource, right? And, and because we, those can be like if, then, when type of, re, type of rules, right? 
Um, so you really need to, this is really the solution, right? Now there's some mitigation approaches. Uh, what makes this problem worse is if I have some iterative IDs. So if I can say account one, two, three, once I have access to account one, two, three, I can iterate one, two, four, one, two, five, one, two, six. As you can see, this is easier than if this is not an iterative ID, right? So that's a mitigation. Don't use this kind of IDs. Don't expose internal IDs. So there's some mitigation. Of course, put rate limiting in place, same as a authentication. You'll see rate limiting is playing a huge role across those different problems, OK? And again, we have to test this. And you can learn much more about this. But think about this. This is API 1. This is really about authorization, right? And API 5 is really about uh, it's really about operations. So making sure no one can call an operation that you don't want them to. And here, the easiest thing to do is really to take a positive security approach by which you're going to just block the calls that are not allowed, right? That's what we want to do. So um, again, authorization policies, you want to test those. Um, you don't want to mix operations that require different authorization types, like typically admin and non-admin operations in the same API, right? And you want to restrict um, one way or another those admin operations, right? So again here, do not rely on clients, as we said from an architecture point of view. It's not the client app that's going to say, oh, you're not an admin, so I'm not going to show that in the UI, right? That's cool in the UI, that's not going to work if I go straight to the API. And again, you will have to test this. We'll get back to testing is critical, right? Um, and the last part is all about data. So there's basically three things here that happen all the time from a data perspective. A, we expose too much data. That's API 3, number 3 on the list, right? B, we accept too, many, too much data in that we're not supposed to accept. And C, it's more you know, something that we all know about, we've heard about this for a long time, which are injections, OK? So what is this all about? Really, it's all about validation. It's all about mastering your data, knowing your data, and making sure that you do not accept inbound or outbound anything that is not something you're expecting. So you need to know what this data is. You need to know how to, you need to enforce that uh, inbound and outbound. Uh, so on request and responses, this is very important, right? You want to control what comes in, what comes out. That means the headers. That means anything coming through, you know, any data, not just the body, right? That's really critical. It's also making sure you properly design your error responses. Don't give away, of course, exceptions. Of course, too much information. So this is all about design again, right? And that has a huge impact there uh, when we have PII. So all the responses, make sure you don't, you know, go clear, put in the clear some information that, that you deem as being sensitive within your environment, right? Um, and again, you will have to test this, okay? This is really big, right? If, if everyone was doing this properly, a lot of the problems will you know, pretty quickly go away. And we know that, right? So before consuming or returning any information, we have to validate it, right? And that's also true for JOTs. So we tend to forget about this because this is not in the payload, but it's really data we're transporting around. Um, so you also have to apply the recommendations and best practices, even in an RFC, on actually how to do this. So that at a high level, anything that flows through your API that contains some data needs to be validated. I think that's the key requirement here, right? And, and I will finish to talk about proactive security. So what does that mean, right? There's a lot of things that are problems in API security today that come from bad design decisions. And if you make a bad design decision, that is going to be really hard to fix automatically after the, the fact, you right know? You will have to go back to design. You will have to change a lot of things. So my recommendation is a lot of you know, stuff in here, but at high level is to use all what we know about um, the different top 10 as a, a design, you know, um, I would say driver and a design, um, 
information, right, to properly create and properly design our API. So again, what is the risk? Um, what is the data? Creating those policies we talked about, define the information. All of this are design decisions. So that's why what we want to do is use this top 10 as a framework for designing and testing your APIs. Testing is super critical. And why is this super critical? And why do you want to do this early? Because the more you wait, the more expensive fixing those problems are going to be, right? If I find an issue at design or development stage, I'm not stressed, not so much, right? I can take the time to actually fix it. Um, this is very, very different. Some of our customers tell us we can't even fix this thing, and yet we need to rewrite the entire API to be able to fix those problems. That's exactly where you don't want to be, right? And the second thing is you need to think like hikers. You need to, you know, every single page that I gave you, it was saying test. You have to test absolutely all those bad cases for every single, you know, functional test that you write that will give you a, a code 200 that works basically and that's great right you have tons of security and negative tests to write testing in your everyday life it needs to be become part of your dna to write those negative tests to write those security tests every time you create something new in your apis right and to automate all of this as well if you have 450 APIs, there's no way you're going to do this manually. You will have to automate. So you write your test, cool. They go in the CI CD automatically, right? Um, all, all those validations that need to go in there so that we can scale and that we can avoid, you know, unfortunately, we're humans, we make errors. So this is your way to protect yourself against those uh, human errors, okay? And this is... Uh, the end of this uh, session for now and um, um, welcoming your your questions, if any. Uh, th thank you, Isabel. Um, so you emphasize testing a, a great deal here. C can mm -hmm. you elaborate on dynamic testing, static testing, manual penetration testing? What, what mix of testing techniques do you think are ideal? Absolutely. A great question. So um, there's many different things to test um, in, in the wall stack. If I'm you know, focusing on what I've been discussing now, it can be um, testing, uh, it can be SAST, it can be DAST. Uh, there's some problems in terms here of the uh, you know, typical SQL injections or typical code uh, problems that will be discovered through this. Mm -hmm. Now, what I would recommend though, is to use testing tools that, would, that understand really well APIs and API context, and back to what I was mentioning before, you have tools, for example, that can test your APIs from an open API or a Swagger definition, which gives you this, this context of you know, knowing if this is what I'm testing, that's what that API does, and this is the, the specific data this API is actually using that will give you much more accurate uh, findings. Um, so there's lots of tools right now, open source or commercial, that allow you to do this. And, and then, you know, yes, that's going to help you and free a lot of time of your, uh, of your AppSec teams in terms of manual testing. And then in manual testing, yeah, you will have some, you know, business logic testing and more advanced testing that they can do manually. But at least all this basic, I would say, testing based off the contract of the API will be done automatically as part of CI/CD, for example. Um, excellent. I think that 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 testing aspect could itself be a, a whole a whole segment here at API yeah. Days. Um, <laughs> yeah. Last last, uh, last question. The, the very first recommendation that you shared with us was related to developing a threat model. So, mm -hmm. can you provide any any advice, best practices, standards that a security team and an app dev team should be using to to generate a threat model for their applications or an APIs? Yeah, there's there is a, a lot that can be taken from the traditional application security uh, threat modeling, but at a very high level, it's all about again understanding where the key actors uh, that are going to interact uh, with your API, what is the data, and what the API is actually doing. And and one thing you know, so there's lots of stuff at the OWASP. If you look for the Stride model that I was uh, pointing to, there's a lot of information you will find there. 
Um, one thing which is really key to finish on this, and, and this is an overall thought, API security is not a one-time thing. That's just like a point in time. You define what security is, and you never look at it again. right? And the same ap applies to that threat model. So every time you change something in who is going to access the API, what is the data this API is going to access, you have to go back to that threat model and reevaluate what the potential risks are and take decisions from that. Uh, well said, um, uh, Isabel. We are uh, we're at time here, so I, I just want to thank you for for spending the afternoon with us, um, uh, Isabel Mooney, uh, uh, co-founder of Forty Two Crunch and uh, Field CTO. Thank you, and uh, have a great afternoon, Isabel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.